Welcome to Never Again Is Now, a podcast about anti-Semitism. I am Evelyn Marcus. And I am Phyllis Dimbler miller The anti-Israel campus protests we have seen since October 7 did not come up spontaneously. In this episode, we speak with somebody who went to take a look at some campuses to find out more. Dexter Van Zyl, who was a guest in our show before, is an investigative journalist based in Boston, Massachusetts. He's the managing editor of the website and online newsletter Focus on Western Islamism, FWI, at the Middle East Forum. Focus on Western Islamism educates its readers about the threat posed by Islamism in Western democracies. Dexter, thank you so much for coming back on our show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Today, I get to ask the first question, and I want to know which college campuses you've gone to in the last two months, and what was it you were particularly interested in finding out about? Yeah, in uh, April uh, 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 of this year, in like the third week of April, after the Columbia uh, encampment basically incited a whole bunch of students at campuses throughout the country uh, to engage uh, in anti-Israel and anti Semitic incitement. Uh, I visited uh, Emerson College's encampment, which took place on a public alley in the city of Boston. And then I also uh, made multiple visits to the Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology. And I also went to Harvard University to try and get a better look of what, uh, a good look at what was going on at the encampment at Harvard. Uh, and since then, uh, all of those encampments have been brought to an end. Uh, the MIT police, uh, brought in the police and ended the encampment. They did the same thing at Emerson College. And eventually the encampment that uh, took place at Harvard was brought to an end as well. And uh, what I was there to see was to see, basically document, uh, essentially, if you pardon the expression, uh, a, a campaign that is bringing about, uh, a, for lack of a better word, a modern dark age on college campuses, uh, not just for Jews, but for the campuses in general. Because I think one of the things that we have seen is, is that these encampments, uh, which have been organized largely by Students for Justice in Palestine, an organization that was founded in the early 2000s at the University of California, Berkeley, is basically intent on essentially uh, using a place that's dedicated to free expression, to promoting an ideology that legitimizes the, uh, the destruction of Israel and the oppression of Jews. Uh, not just in the Middle East, uh, but here in the West as well. And one of the interesting things about this, and what really mar attracted my attention, was the manner in which I saw young people on the left essentially promoting or paving the way for uh, an Islamist agenda regarding the Jewish state. And that was really one of the things that was most troubling. And one and a number of commentators, including myself, have essentially said, "Look, this is, looks an awful lot like the Iranian Revolution that took place in 1979, where a coalition of secularists, uh, socialists, communists aligned themselves with, uh, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini, and essentially brought about a revolution and deposed the Shah of Iran, and then the the, uh, the Islamists took over and basically governed the country." Uh, and, and have been oppressing people ever since. And so I, I'm very interested in the manner in which uh, people on the left end up supporting an agenda uh, that is, uh, frankly, it's medieval. And, and so when I say modern dark age, what I'm trying to do is to highlight the fact that uh, modern techniques of communication uh, have been hijacked and used and organ and human organization have been used to essentially promote uh, a, a retrograde uh, agenda that's, I think, antithetical to the pursuit of truth on college campuses and uh, the flourishing of the human spirit. And that's really what I'm interested in. How about we add and uh, the pursuit of democracy? Right. Is what Iran totally lost. Right after the revolution. I mean, people right. think that a revolution means, you know, more democracy, but that's not necessarily what it means. Right. 
What, what, I what think you... one of the yeah the thing that's so bothersome is is that when I was at Emerson College, okay, Emerson is a school that's dedicated to giving people training for journalism in the communications realm. And while I was at the uh, their encampment, uh, students from the school basically interfered with my ability to. Uh, even just gather information. They wouldn't even let me take pictures of the encampment itself. They tried to actually stand in front of me while I took the pictures. And I wanted to say, look, uh, you go to a school that gives people degrees in journalism and the uh, the working capital of journalism in the United States is the First Amendment. And here you are violating my rights to the First Amendment on a public way. What are you doing? What, what and And I think that the school should be embarrassed because that was the anti-democratic impulse on display for everyone to see. I would just like to say, I have an undergraduate degree in journalism, and I was horrified the other day to read a quote by a journalism professor at a major journalism school, but just to make sure I don't get it wrong, I won't say it, who said that journalist, journalism students no longer have to be objective. This is a real, real problem. Right. And I think this is part of... It's part of the larger abandonment of the pursuit of truth on college campuses and, in, and at universities. What has happened is, is that uh, totalitarian movements and, and in some instances their state sponsors have been able to essentially take advantage of- Wait, the, You mean by state sponsored, you mean other country sponsors? Other countries like Qatar or okay. Qatar. Okay. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I, I, at the Middle East forum, I apologize because there are people who can speak Arabic fluently, but I just have to, I can't even speak, you know, pidgin Arabic. I can't speak Hebrew. I can't even say the names that I should be able to say properly. And people work with me on it and it just doesn't work because I'm a Bostonian. But the 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 thing that's so interesting is, is that what they do is, is that we have an open society where people have the right to free speech. And we have institutions that essentially are, are created to promote truth or allow people to pursue truth and have a diversity of thought, opinion. But what has happened is, is that they have allowed themselves to be overrun by ideologues uh, who are essentially working to undermine the very system of democracy that you talked about. And journalism itself has essentially become, in, has in, or journalists have enlisted in that campaign, as that quote indicates. They're no longer interested in pursuing or, or, or relaying uh, an objective truth to the people so that they can remain a self-governing people, but they're essentially trying to corral people and herd them into a, 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 a utopian ideology of their own. And what is this utopian ideology? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. Essentially, if you're talking to the people on the left, it's essentially the diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda which uh, essentially uh, punishes Jews for being successful uh, and, and or or essentially an anti-colonialist agenda, uh, something like, you know, out of the out of Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, which is I think is what they're doing and what they're and I don't know. I, I'm going to kind of go off a little bit, but Franz Fanon, he wrote a book called Wretched of the Earth. Uh, it was published in 1961, the year he died, that basically gave license to third world countries to engage in terrible acts of violence against their former colonial oppressors. Uh, and it was a profoundly influential text. Uh, and he basically portrayed violence as if it were uh, medicine for people of uh, uh, who had lived in oppressed environments. It was said it was the only way that they could get out from under uh, the psychic burden of being an oppressed people. Right. It's a revolutionary and, ideology. Right. Yes. And it, and the thing was, is that, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote the introduction to that. And he basically told the white Europeans, you guys better be on guard. You should be afraid. We deserve this. Uh, and the, the interesting thing is, is that in the years since the publication of that book, what we've seen is, is that Islamists have actually taken up the mantle of that uh, the violence the, uh, that license that and that license to engage in terrible acts of violence has been transferred from the third world uh, in in the abstract to Islamists. And that process of transferring the license to engage in terrible acts of violence has taken place on the very encampments that we have seen throughout the United States. 
Essentially, they are portraying Hamas as a liberationist movement. One of the things that bothered me the most was is that I would take the bus back home after I visited the, the encampments at MIT uh, and Harvard from Cambridge. I saw, I saw both. I went two days in a row, and I saw two young girls or two young women in their early 20s who I suspected might actually be Jewish, okay? And one of the things that I saw was is that they were both wearing kafias. And one of the things that people have asked me a who are, you know, my friends have said, why do we see so many women, young women at these encampments essentially promoting uh, a pro-Hamas agenda? Because what these encampments have done in the United States has legitimized the October 7th massacre, which was one of the worst expressions of anti-Jewish violence since the Holocaust. And it's also, it was a terrible, terrible act of violence against women. Amen. It was, it was unbelievable. And people were protesting in favor of Hamas even before Israel put any troops on the boundary between Israel and the Gaza Strip. So it wasn't, you know, the Israeli use of force that outraged them. It was the terrible acts of violence perpetrated by Hamas against women and children in Israel that brought people out into the streets. That was what brought people out. And when I saw these two young women wearing kafias, my question was to be, what do you think they would do to you? And I have concluded that that may in fact be one of the reasons why they're wearing the kafias. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, an act of submission. At first, I thought that they were wearing the kafias mm largely as a sign, uh, as a fashion statement, to be one of the cool kids. And I want to tell you that since the October 7th massacre, I have seen more people wearing kafias out in the public than I have seen that I saw in 20, uh, you know, 17 or 18 years of doing pro-Israel work before the October 7th massacre. The October 7th massacre made it cool to basically be anti-Israel and be indifferent to the violence perpetrated against Jews in Israel. And the interesting thing is, is that many of the victims uh, at the October 7th massacre were living in kibbutzes that were committed to uh, living in peace uh, with the Palestinians. We're talking about people who were struggling to somehow acknowledge the humanity uh, of the people who lived in the Gaza Strip. We're talking, they were the peaceniks and they got murdered. And so I realized that maybe that the women who were wearing those kafias were basically saying, I am not one of those bad Jews or one of the bad Westerners who's basically trying to stand well, up to you. Yeah. Well, well, Dexter, I, I saw the same thing when I took uh, a look at UCLA uh, at, at the encampment there and, and the protesters did that were around that, the students. I also saw a lot of women wearing the, those Palestinian shawls, kafias. I also saw a lot of saw a lot of men wearing them. Um, we also saw it at the Eurovision Song Contest. A lot of uh, singers, right. artists, there wearing the Palestinian shawl. I I see it more as a, and whether you agree with it or not, but I see it more as a sign of solidarity with the Palestinians who got either in their minds oppressed by the Israelis or after Israel struck back, uh, who are attacked by the Israelis. Right. And not so much a sign of submission. Why, why do you say that? I think because I think one of the things that I, I'm bothered by is, is that an awful lot, of, I guess there, and, and I... The gender politics I've been thinking about pretty, pretty closely for a long time. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is, is that there's been a notion that essentially Western males are, are if you pardon the expression, evil. And I don't want to overstate that. But ultimately, there is a notion that essentially that because Westerners engaged in acts of genocide against the indigenous people here in North America, 
Hmm. Uh, and that we were like some of the, the people, you know, we had slaves here in North America. Um, and there's this notion that ultimately that, that Western men are essentially the ultimate source of evil in the world. But then one of the interesting things is that now we see uh, Arab and Muslim men engaging in terrible acts of violence, and there is no real pushback against it. And so I think maybe people have understood that that license that I talked about has been given to Arabs and Muslims in such a way so that there's really no way that they can stand up against it without being portrayed as Islamophobes or racists. And so instead of actually condemning it publicly, the best they can do is essentially demonstrate that they are not reasonable targets of the, that type of violence. Right. And yeah. that that then that that's I think maybe the underlying logic, maybe it's a little too oblique, maybe it's a little too tenuous, but there is something going on because uh if you want an example of uh you know deplorable male behavior, take a look at October 7th and why is it that that no one is really pointing that out? Because yes. It was a terrible act of misogyny. We yes. know it was. There's just no way around it. Right. Even the United Nations uh, women organizations took a long, long time, and it took a lot of pressure on them. Right. Right. To and condemn. I think it's because of the license that has been given to uh, Arabs and Muslims uh, that was basically rooted in Franz Fanon's book, uh, you know, Wretched of the Earth. Which and is yeah. So it's 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 that. Uh, um, revolutionary thinking, um, uh, oppressed people of color in um, in the non-Western world who were colonialized or are colonialized, and and people of color in the West who are oppressed by the privileged yeah. white, uh, that almost any means is acceptable to get out of that oppression. That's that's the thinking. It seems right. Correct. I just, I just yeah. want to and put get out from under the guilt that comes with being a Westerner as well. Yeah. For those of our listeners who don't know, Sheryl Sandberg, formerly the COO of Facebook, uh, went to Israel shortly after October 7th and did a interviewed first responders. And now everyone can see it for free on YouTube. It's a documentary. It's called Screams Before Silence. And for those of you who are and I understand squeamish about seeing actual terrible pictures. They don't. They made a decision. It's it's mentioned in the, in, in the documentary that they didn't show the most horrifying things you could possibly see because they, out of respect to the victims and the families, but they want you to watch the uh, documentary and learn. So, you know, it's pretty easy. We Once you look at the link, if you come across anyone who doesn't believe it, you can send them the link to the free documentary on YouTube. Screams before silence. Right. So um, it's not necessarily that uh, these students don't believe what happened at October 7th, although some don't believe it. Uh, they said so. But it's also that they, if they believe it, they still uh, legitimize it in their minds. Right. Correct. Right. Right. They so downplay I, it, yeah, you know, or or legitimize it. Okay. So that's is that the reason why we see so many students uh, join pro Hamas protests? You think? Yeah, I think that's that's ultimately part of it. Is is that I think that ultimately, uh, one of the things that I've been saying a, a lot over the past few years is that the tactics and methods used to delegitimize the Jewish state have also been deployed against Western democracies. And the campaign of de demonization, delegitimization, in the, and, I, you know, and I know that, uh, that we have the 3D test, and I, I can't summon all of the 3Ds, but also disorientation. There have been, there's an attempt on the part of an awful lot of anti-Israel activists to disorient Israeli Jews and into thinking that somehow that their state is illegitimate. And the thing is, is that I think for the most part, I think that campaign in some instances has been successful, but I think for the most part, I think it's failed. 
but it has not failed against the West. Essentially, the Westerners, uh, you know, have been portrayed uh, in the media and in the, the social media as essentially a source of everything that's wrong with the world and that we are the authors of, of, of all of the suffering in the world. And I think that there, the best word to describe it is cognitive warfare. I think the mm. Jewish people have been subjected to a cognitive warfare pretty much throughout their history. Would you like to give uh, a definition? I think it's an interesting it's basically, term. Basically, and I, I'm, you know, uh, what I would, all right, be, I will give an on the run definition, but it's basically to distort the, the, the enemy's thinking into thinking that somehow the civilization that they belong to is not really worth defending. Um, and that the whole goal of it is to essentially get them to the enemy soldier uh, to, to lay down his weapons, so to speak. Um, and the image that I, uh, and, and at a certain point, either it's because of exhaustion or because basically a sense, the, sense that they've decided that the, the, the organization or community that they belong to uh, or, or the, the country of which they are citizens really is no longer worth being worth protecting. Um, and the, the problem is, is that in the world that we live in, if you live in a community or our nation state, there are times when you're going to have to actually use violence to protect that nation state from destruction. That's that's the reality. And it's an unfortunate reality, but that's the world that we live in. And I don't think that that reality is going to change anytime soon. OK. Um, but what 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 cognitive warfare does, and this is something that Richard Landis, who's a, a expert on this, and he's uh, he's a former, I think he's a professor emeritus from Boston University, and he's written a lot. Uh, he talks a lot about this, and I I think that the Israelis have been targets, and, and American Jews have been targets of cognitive warfare, and some American Jews have actually fell prey to this, but. One of the things that we see is, is that there are young people who have been instructed into thinking that the West is singularly evil, that it has not really provided any good benefits to humanity in general, and that the only way that they can actually somehow justify themselves as human beings is to side with the people who are enemies of the West. And that is one of the things that they can do at the encampments. And the thing is, is that they start with Israel, they get people, they get people inculcated into thinking that Israel is the source, singular source of suffering in the Middle East, and that the Palestinians are somehow the Christ-like sufferers in, in, mm. in the Middle East, that uh, the Palestinians don't have any real agency of their own, that they're not in any way responsible for the suffering that they're endured, despite the fact that their leaders have turned down numerous peace offers. And it, once the logic is accepted against Israel, and the, the Israelis and Jews are largely portrayed as white people, well, then the same logic is actually uh, deployed, embraced by non-Jewish white people here in the United States as well. And, and one of the things that I have said before is, is that Israel has become the ram in the thicket. And, and it comes from uh, you know, the story of Abraham basically going up to Mount Moriah with his son Isaac and at one point, he believes that he's supposed to essentially kill his, sacrifice his son. And instead, basically, there's a ram in the thicket that is the substitute for it and the, the, for his son. And so what has happened is, is that now that Israel, to demonstrate your moral superiority and that you're not an author of Western oppression mm. of the third world peoples, you can basically demonstrate that you support Israel. I mean, that you support Israel's enemies and enemies, support, enemies. legitimately, ultimately support Israel's destruction. And at that point, you no longer have to subject uh, Hamas, the men in Hamas, to any sort of judgment whatsoever. Um, and essentially, you can give them license to do whatever it is that they think is necessary. And uh, and the problem is, is that once you've accepted that logic with Israel, then why, how is the United States any different? How are Western democracies in the West any different from Israel? They're not. And so at a certain point, people will not go to the barricades, so to speak, to defend th their societies from Islamism or uh, or or far leftism that basically portrays um, 
the countries that they are that they live in as evil. And uh, there's this notion, and I I think back to a book that I read a few months ago called The God That Failed, which taught which was essentially about young Westerners. Uh, in the 1930s, essentially embracing communism and supporting S Stalin uh, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And essentially, and why did they do that? Because they were privileged Westerners living in Europe, and they felt guilty about the status and suffering of the poor that they saw in their midst. And so the way that they basically transcended or tr got out from under that guilt was is that they embraced uh, a, a dictatorial agenda and turned their a blind eye to the terrible things that Stalin had done. Um, so, and I think that that's a similar process is taking place here in the West. And anti-Israel uh, propaganda is essentially just the opening, the gateway to that agenda. Yes, that's what's so, going on so, long term. Right. So so it's 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 really great that you that you lay this out for us. I just um, um, read an article uh, in the free press this week uh, by Ayan Hirsiali. Uh, that's uh, the title is "We Are Subverted," um, yep. in which she lays out exactly the the steps by which um, she has observed in her uh, country of origin, uh, Somalia, uh, by which uh, a, a revolution takes place. Um, to overthrow the government even. And um, that was um, um, also explained, she, she writes, by uh, a defected KGB agent. You can uh, find the interview with him in which he lays out how, to, how they do that. Um, you can find it on YouTube. His name is Yuri Bezmenov. Um, and phase number one, is demor demoralizing the society of your enemy, uh, which is in the case of um, a, a socialist or communist or Marxist revolution that we are facing now as well. Um, the enemy is the capitalist or the, fr the free society. Um, so demoralizing them and phase one is, th that's phase one. And how to do that, that's the, the most intensive phase uh, that takes about 25 to 30 years, a whole generation, and you do it through education. So is that what we're seeing here on our university? Oh, yes. Yeah. I think that's exactly what's happened. In the Middle East Forum, we've had, we've had a program called Campus Watch, where essentially we go after Middle East studies uh, professors who were essentially promoting an anti-Israel and anti-Western agenda on college campuses. And, and I think that that's really what I'm afraid of is, is that the encampments represent a, a culmination of, of this, uh, this campaign and, it, it, and, and an advancement of it. For a couple of days after October seventh, I thought, okay, now people are really going to really understand what's going to what what's what what's at stake here. Okay. Uh, and as it turned out, people actually came out in support of Hamas th throughout Europe yeah, and North America. Uh, and it wasn't just the, the Islamists, and they were there, but it was also people on the left. And, and I, I think that's really one of the things that's really profoundly bothersome. And, and, uh, and, and so, I think on one hand, we're going to need some sort of intellectual awakening now. And the thing is, I don't think it's 100 percent because there was at one college. Uh, it took, I can't remember the name of the college, but at a certain point, uh, the SJP protesters approached uh, an American flag and they were getting ready to take it down. And a group of fraternity boys uh, at this frater at, you know, fraternity, you know, I was a member of a college fraternity and I know those types of guys <laughs> and they, you know, and, uh, and they basically said, no, you're not taking this flag down. Uh, and the, the problem is, is that one of the, th and you know, North Carolina, I can, what university yeah, of North Carolina. Right. So, and there were some, and, and I, the irony is, is that the American South may in fact become one of the places where we will see real opposition to this campaign. And 
And, and the problem is, is that for some people, given the South is, South's history of slavery, they're going to say, well, they are not a legitimate bulwark of freedom. But the fact is, is that uh, they have transcended in many respects their history of slavery. They have moved past it. And one of the interesting things is that the people, the intellectuals outside the South, generally, they keep looking around for a white Southerner to basically uh, portray themselves as superior to. OK, that's one of the things that I have seen. And, and so and pro-Israel Zionists, they will they will fit that bill. I grew up in a, 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 the United Church of Christ, which was Congregationalist. We were part of the abolitionist movement. The church basically had a huge amount of its identity invested in its involvement with the abolitionist movement. And we portrayed ourselves as adversaries to fundamentalist Protestants. Uh, and then when that kind of faded, they looked around and said, OK, who are we going to be better than now? And it was going to be, well, those those Zionists or the Christian Zionists or the people who supported Israel. And I think that's one of the things is that, you know, it's a human impulse to always look around for somebody that, to be better than. And yeah. the problem is, is that in order to demonstrate that you're better than somebody else, some of these folks have embraced a political agenda that uh, is profoundly dis dis destructive. That's really the misogyny of Hamas, the anti-Semitism of Hamas, the hostility of uh, Hamas towards uh, the LGBTQ community is outrageous, and uh, and is and yet by by where by supporting Hamas after the attack, people are demonstrating themselves to be on the right side of history. And I just I you know on a logical level I don't get it, but on a psychological level I I I I, I see it. Right. I can understand so, so it. Yes. So, so people all, especially young people, look for a way to be, to be good people and were made to believe that this is the way to go. Now, before we end this interview, I have one question, actually two questions. One is, is this getting into the heads of our students uh, big time? And if so, is it happening inside the classroom or uh, during uh, demonstrations like this and, and encampments like this and on social media? Is it in the school or is it outside the school? And the second question is, after you answer this, uh, what should we do? Okay, it's happening both. It's in the classroom, it's at the encampments. And I speak to some people who are adjunct professors uh, at schools here in the New England area. And they say, and they, they are not supportive of any of this, okay? And they, you know, when I, when I get on my high horse about how bad things are at colleges, one of the things they say to me is, is that they say, don't blame us because these kids, when they come into colleges, they are already indoctrinated to embrace this stuff. Um, and as far as what should be done about it, I think one of the things is that, like, all right, short term, if you... Uh, participate in one of these encampments and you and you harass Jews and you basically violate the law and you use a campus university uh, campus or college campus to do that you should be expelled that's the first thing uh, secondly we are going to need a longer term we're going to need more uh, intellectual diversity on college campuses because we're going to need to actually expose uh, people to ideas that they may, you know, we need we need to remind people that look, you know, it was the West that brought an end to slavery. It was the British Navy that brought an end to slavery, and the holdouts were tribal chiefs in uh, Africa, and political leaders in Africa, and um, Muslim rulers in the Middle East. They were the holdouts, and that would be one thing. And we need to in instruct people in a better knowledge of history and that's going to take some work um and i think longer term um i i think parents are just going to have to stop sending their kids to colleges and universities 
where these encampments take place. And as soon as the administrators realize that this is going on, uh, their money and their legitimacy comes from the middle class, the American middle class. People go to college so that they can become middle class or stay in the middle class or make sure that their kids can get into the middle class. And I think, you know, being somebody that is in the middle class, I think that that, you know, the, the middle class of any country is a great force for good overall. It's not perfect, but the thing is, is that it brings people out of poverty and, and it, it creates a buffer to revolutionary movements and it gives people a space to essentially flourish as human beings. Um, but we, we've been, and I think once we do that, once the colleges and universities recognize that if people are allowed to disrupt encampments, harass their fellow students and intimidate them and assault them with impunity, it's gonna come out of them. People will not send their, stu their children to these schools. I think that's, for the short term, that's what I'm hoping for. Okay. Okay, so we're about to end. Is there any last thought that you'd like to add? Well, I started out by talking about uh, the, you know, people trying to promote uh, or, or advancing the cause of a modern dark age. And I think one of the things that we have to acknowledge is, is that Islamism is a force that promotes, uh, advances that dark age but that there are a whole bunch of people within the Muslim world that don't want to live like that. Exactly. And uh, Islamism has lost a lot of its legitimacy uh, in the Middle East, largely as a result of the suffering that it's imposed. Um, and that we should really take our, uh, our inspiration from the men and women in Iran who are essentially fighting against uh, the, the religious-minded uh, theocrats uh, in Iran. And... You know, I, I think we need, for, here I am, I think we need a, a, a women life freedom campaign here in the West. Right. And um, for, for, for those of us who, who, who want to invite speakers about the Islamic world um, or from the Islamic world, um, speakers who are uh, who want us to move in the direction of a modern world, not in the direction of a middle-aged Islamist world. Uh, you can look at the website claritycoalition.org and find speakers there uh, to invite. Yes, I'll put it in the description of this uh, interview. So I thank you so much for coming on, Dexter. Really, this is, again, coming on this show, so informative. I thank our listeners. For those of you who want to know more about Evelyn and myself and our work, you can go to Never Again Is Now podcast at YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And as we end every session, we say, please speak up against anti-Semitism and all hate.